Okay, so we're going to talk about Sauropoda morpha. This is, in fact, I think one of my favorite groups. It doesn't mean it has to be your favorite group. In fact, it could be your least favorite group. It doesn't matter to me. I just find them fascinating because no other terrestrial mammals have managed to get this large, or even close to this large. Uh, the largest mammals, by comparison, were small, small to maybe medium-sized sauropods. Really nothing like uh, these super large animals. And these animals, by default, are going to change the function of ecosystems just because of the way they're going to interact with them. And they are, uh, in some ways, almost impossible to imagine um, because they are so big and they do things so differently. And some of the things that we've learned about them uh, turns out are, are probably because they share a lot of features with birds as well. Again, that shouldn't really surprise you. They both belong to Sauritians. But before we knew where birds sat within this tree, it was really hard to imagine how could these things do this. Well, if you have a bird model and you look at it and say, well, they're probably doing something like this, then it's some things can start to make a little more sense. But there's lots of ranges in size here. The smallest members of this group are going to start out tiny. You're going to be chicken size or smaller. The largest members of this group are going to be, I, I guess the best way to describe it is building size. I, I don't think it's hard to grasp the size of these animals without actually being able to stand. So if you go to a museum and you look at some of these animals, you'll sort of get a grasp for how large they are. I used to say an easy rule is that they were the size of a herd of elephants, but that's now too small. Um, these are animals larger than that. So it's, they're huge, huge, huge animals. So here's a branch that we're going to deal with. There's a fair amount of diversity here. What you'll look at uh, when we go through this is that a lot of the animals, of course, that we know about, we think about as sauropods, of course, are quadrupedal, and very obviously so. The animal weighs many, it can weigh up to 100 tons, let's say. You have to be quadrupedal. How could you put that much weight onto uh, just two limbs? Uh, but the early primitive members of the group, of course, follow the rule that we've seen before, that they start out as bipeds, and then they are relatively small and, and start to pick up these traits and become larger and larger. Sauropods evolve relatively early. Now, we have lots of good fossils from all different ages. So as a result, of course, they're present all across the, the globe. We have them from everywhere, as far as we can tell. Interestingly about sauropods, of course, is because of the continental drift, but their appearance early, they do appear to evolve separately on different continents. So you can actually find very different strategies for living in sauropods on different continents, courtesy of the fact uh, that they, they didn't interact. One of the cool things about sauropods, too, is uh, because they're so large, right, and they're probably producing lots of offspring, and many of them are probably getting eaten as well, you're going to have really awesomely large predators evolve to take advantage of them, too. Some of the largest predators that have ever evolved on land will evolve probably to, to take down and kill small and medium-sized sauropods. Probably by the time you get to an adult sauropod, there's no theropod dinosaur which is going to fill up our uh, carnivorous niches that's going to be large enough to take them down unless they're injured or dying already. It's probably not able to just bite and kill a large sauropod dinosaur. And then this other group we're going to talk about are the prosauropods, and this is a primitive group that, have, that uh, your book talks about giving rise to the sauropods. I'll talk a little bit about, about that in general, but uh, that is the primitive members of the group, which will tend to be bipedal, but we'll look at some of them so we actually have a good idea about what those may have looked like. So sauropods are, I think, I think by anyone's definition, these are classic dinosaurs, right? These are the most dinosaur of dinosaurs up there with Triceratops. There is nothing like them. There is no way to get confused by them, right? We wouldn't say to a child, oh, that's a sauropod, you fool. You're thinking of a snake, right? That's not <laughs> that. There's, it, there is no simple uh, group that looks anything like them, right? Living or dead. They're very distinctly different from everybody else. They are, I think, uh, one of the, the problems that people have with them is uh, they think that they are stupid and slow, and that they may in fact be stupid, and they're probably relatively slow, uh, but, and just because they're not around today, they are therefore primitive, right? They're these sort of leftovers. They're in fact not primitive. They're extremely derived groups of archosaurs. Archosaurs are already extremely derived groups of diapsids. And sauropods modify this archosaur body into this truly enormous uh, uh, eating, herbivorous eating machine. It's really never rivaled 
uh, within the animal kingdom after that, or probably even before that at any point. Again, I, I do want to stress that I, I'm talking about large animals here. They are certainly large, and they certainly are large for a long period of time, but they span a range of sizes. So they go from very, very small to very, very large. And probably in an ecosystem, you probably have a mix when they were the, in the Jurassic, especially when, when sauropods were most diverse, you probably have a mix of small to large animals. And when I say small, I do mean that they're, they're still be large to you, but small in the sense that their adult size is not um, the length of two school buses or something. These are things that are going to be on the order of sizes of cars, right? Still a large animal. Uh, but not as large as some of the other things. And at the very primitive stages, uh, sauropods will be smaller. Your book spends a lot of time talking about prosauropods versus sauropods, and it refers to prosauropods as a single group. I just wanted you to be aware that that's, I, I'm more, I think that that's more of an opinion view than it is an actual known fact. We suspect that prosauropods are a group, um, they argue that they are, but prosauropods may in fact just be a grouping of sauropod-like animals that have a bunch of primitive features that the group brings to the table, and then from them one member uh, eventually uh, acquires more characteristics that look like a sauropod, and eventually we name them sauropods. So just be aware that yes, sauropods and prosauropods by your book's definition are just a V, so you have prosauropods on one side, they carry a lot of the primitive traits, and you have sauropods on the other side, and that's the derived group. That, that may be true, but I'm not guaranteeing to you that it is the case. And one of the problems that I would warn you about is, right, when you get down here, we have relatively few members in a lot of cases, but we do have lots of branching. So we may end up in a case where there's a branch coming out from within a prosauropod group, and as soon as, if that were to happen, then, pro, then all sauropods would therefore be prosauropods with very modified features that would, would have them named as another group. Down here, though, you can see, um, I think what is very clear here, you're going to start with these little bipedal guys, right, little tiny chicken-sized guys, and you're going to end up with animals that are going to get increasingly larger and larger and larger as we go along. So this is Eoraptor. You've actually seen it before. I've showed him to you a couple of times. This is yet another reconstruction of that animal. You can see this is a very small thing. We used to consider this a primitive theropod dinosaur. Now, re recently, we, uh, the skull was re-examined, and it appears actually have uh, prosauropod traits and not theropod traits. So this is actually lump it in with the, uh, the, the sauropod amorpha, which is great, right? So what should a sauropod amorpha primitive me most primitive member look like? It should look very similar to a very primitive theropod, right? They should be very, very closely aligned. Lo and behold, that's what we see. And that also suggests that this animal is probably omnivorous, maybe tending towards carnivory, but probably eating lots of different stuff as well, and that, that at the evolution of herbivory in this group probably gets picked up uh, later within that member. These guys, of course, I have mentioned this before, this is true of a lot of the dinosaurs, but uh, these guys appear early, so this group appears relatively early, relatively soon after dinosaurs appear, as far as we know. Uh, they start out as bipedal, and by the, the, the period at which they go extinct, the end of the Cretaceous, they will, as far as we know, they will all be obligate quadrupeds. And that's probably true. They probably were at that point all obligate quadrupeds. Any positioning of a smaller to medium-sized animal was probably conquered by the duckbills at that point, right? They're probably taking over those, that niche space. Uh, re they continue to reduce their head size. So they start out stupid, they get dumber. They are not intelligent animals. These are animals that are going to have a very small number of re rehearsable reactions with very minimal learning. And there's probably reasons for that, and we'll talk about that. But they're going to reduce in head size as we go. Next, they're going to increase substantially in length from the smallest animals to the largest animals. You, and if you just remember back to that Eoraptor, Eoraptor does not, it has a long snake like neck, but it's not unusually long. By the time we get to things like brachiosaurs, you're going to be having necks that are as long um, as the body itself or longer. Right? That's really a lot of, of head and neck length. And then uh, the legs, because these guys become quadrupeds relatively quickly, because they tend to bear, they're probably bearing enormous amounts of weight, the legs are going to be approximately equal in size relatively quickly. We'll see that, uh, that, that uh, be a trend within this group. Platyosaurus is probably one of the best known, and this is what is classically called a prosauropod, one of the best known pro prosauropods. This animal has uh, 
a, a stance that allows you to reconstruct it in a bipedal stance. But you'll notice that when it's bipedal, its chest tends to come forward and it can reach down with those arms and, and touch the ground. So it's probably occasionally able to do quadrupedal. And it's probably, if it's walking over relatively dense jungle area, it could probably move material in front of it or step over logs by putting its hand down on the ground. So that would probably help it position itself. Or if it's, if it's pulling on plant material, it may use its arms to pull plant material towards it. Or if it's walking, it may uh, occasionally reach down and, and uh, go into a quadrupedal stance. But you'll notice that there are some things about this which are not going to be, it's not going to be a great quadruped. So it's certainly not spending a lot of time being quadrupedal. It has really big long claws, which aren't really great being, you don't want to drag those around in the dirt. And the arms just aren't quite long enough to be worth it to spend lots of time on them, nor are the fingers aligned to, to transport lots of weight back up into the arm, right? You just don't see that. The fingers would have to come out to the side, and that would not be great uh, because that would put the uh, weight up into the, the arm bone through the, the wrist, which is not exactly what you want to do um, if you want to put lots of weight on it. The head over here, you can't see it very well, but I'll describe it to you. The head is relatively simple. This will be true, again, of sauropods going forward. It does have teeth. Uh, they do occlude uh, in a sense that they close and, and cut material. They do not chew. Uh, sauropods are, are not chewers by and large. Uh, and that animal also, we know it's herbivorous because we have gut content. Platyosaurus is incredibly common. We have hundreds of their skeletons. Uh, but we actually also know that they ate meat occasionally because we have small lizards in their gut as well. So at some point, these animals, um, probably occasionally if they ran into a small animal, were able to grab it, they would and eat that animal. And that's not really that surprising. Protein is protein. Uh, and again, these guys are coming from an ancestor that was probably carnivorous. So it probably pays to be occasionally carnivorous to get a little extra protein and because your body can support it. One thing I noticed when I was doing this is that you'll notice that here, uh, in the pelvic region, you have uh, this, the, within the, the pubic bones, you have this forward thrusting bone here that comes out into the gut cavity, right? So you have a lot of the space over here. You can make a triangle back here of wasted space. In later members, this bone will tend to rotate backwards slightly to provide probably more room for the gut. We just don't see it in platyosaurus. And this is a reconstruction of the animal running down below. Again, relatively believable, I think. Uh, you can, the bones can certainly appear to support some amount of running within these animals. So this, again, is a very classic prosauropod. Large animal, probably have a really hard time getting it into the room, but you probably could. They're probably on the scale of herbivory carnivory. They're probably 99, 95% herbivorous. But if they run into a small animal, they run into eggs, they're probably more than happy to eat those. Uh, the belly ribs are gonna be, we always have belly ribs. You're just gonna see them occasionally not drawn. So don't let that fool you. So that's one thing I think when I, now that I know to look for them when you go to a museum, you'll often see them not mounted. It doesn't mean they didn't have them. It just means they're not gonna mount them. So just be aware when you see them. So this is a good prosauropod. This appears in the Triassic. These are uh, common uh, to the degree that dinosaurs are common, but they're not, they don't exactly dominate the ecosystem in any way. This is another prosauropod, but this is very close to the branch point. A couple of things have happened here. Uh, one, the body has really started to move into an all quadrupedal stance. It's really starting to give up that walking on a bipedal area. The fingers now, uh, you'll notice that it's really walking on the tips of its fingers as opposed to on the, the wrist. You don't, really, you don't want to walk on the wrist, right? That's not a good place to put weight. You really want to be on the fingers, uh, the tips of them, so that the weight goes up the column of the finger into the arm and then up into the shoulder, uh, into the body of the animal, so you can put the weight straight down onto the ground and support yourself. So you're seeing that there. The feet now are starting to get this pad um, in the back to provide a bigger, broader foot to put more weight on top of. You'll notice again uh, that the rest of the body is relatively similar. Relatively simple head, relatively simple teeth, certainly not doing any chewing. Uh, and the size of the head has not really changed, but the body has changed, right? So this is going to be a character that's going to see a sauropod. The bodies are going to keep getting bigger. The heads are going to stay the same size or get smaller. So the brains are always going to be reducing in size relative to the animal. And then this is a classic sauropod, right? So the last two were prosauropods, and this is one of these very classic sauropods. 
look now uh, here. We've got a couple things going on. One, we've got lots of neck vertebrae, right? Lots and lots of neck vertebrae, and some of them are big, 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 big neck vertebrae. Uh, we're going to talk about that, but these their vertebrae are actually hollow. If you look at the head, again, the head, the head is large, <laughs> but not to the body. It's not a big head. There's not much going on. The, for whatever reason, it's not entirely clear why the nostrils have moved up on top of the head. So people used to argue that was because they spent a lot of time underwater like whales, and so the nostrils needed to be on top of the head so they could breathe. That's probably not the case, but the nostrils are located up high on the head. Again, simple peg-like teeth, not really doing much in the way of chewing. Look at how, look at how columnar these legs or these arms have become, right? Basically just up and down uh, uh, units to provide weight up, uh, up into the body. Uh, and help carry the animal, or provide, I should say provide weight down into the ground to help uh, position the animal. Back here on the, the uh, feet, what has probably happened at this point, what this artist has reconstructed probably correctly, they probably have a large fat pad that sits right at the back where the heel would be, not dissimilar from how elephants work, and that's so that when you put a lot of weight on the back of the foot, it helps cushion the foot, spread the weight out over an area, protects the bone, and provides a stable platform for you to walk on. And that's probably relatively important for an animal that weighs many uh, let's say 20, 30, 40, 50 tons, because if it makes one long step and falls over, it would literally die because you can't afford to fall. So animals like these really have to be stable. Still, they often have long tails. This actually has an a, unusually short tail, uh, but look at the size of this gut space now, right? There's a lot of space for these guts, uh, and there's probably a lot of musculature uh, up and around the neck to support it. So there's lots of stuff going on in these guys. And we're going to talk about how they actually do this because being this large is actually extremely difficult. It's really, really hard to get animals up this size. Okay, for food and feeding. Like I said, the early members are probably, the very earliest members at the branch point with theropods are probably carnivores. Uh, but very rapidly, these guys appear to adopt an omnivorous lifestyle and then move into herbivory relatively quickly after that. So they probably move through omnivory to herbivory relatively quickly. Generally, most of them are not even chewers to begin with. A few number of them do have some small amount of chewing, but it's very, very small, and it's not developed at all like we saw in the, uh, on the ornithischians in any way. Jaw joint here is slightly below the tooth joint. Again, these aren't great characteristics for chewers. Teeth are often leaf-shaped, but there is uh, a lot of range and, and size differences and shapes for these guys. And there's often relatively little wear on them. So they aren't spending a lot of time with food in their mouth. They're just grabbing it, pulling it down into the body, and letting the body do the work, which, again, is not particularly surprising. And they probably feed uh, extremely heavily on gymnosperms, or I should say they fed extremely, because we don't have any members left. They fed extremely heavily on gymnosperms, which, of course, are your pines, right? Your pines and conifers and that kind of thing. So if you imagine, what eats pines and conifers? Well, historically, uh, sauropods did, uh, and they ate probably a lot of them. You could probably imagine an animal like that needing to eat uh, the weight of a tree or more, right, easily within a day. So they are eating a lot of those uh, plants uh, frequently. There's some debate about this, too, whether they help to drive the evolution of gymnosperms and vice versa. Um, and actually, there are some trees that, look, that we have that are probably either very similar or uh, maybe potentially even the same species that existed during uh, the Jurassic, and those are apparently very well adapted for getting fed on uh, at lower heights and seem to do a lot of their growth up really, really high, which is exactly what you'd want them to do. Uh, don't put any growth where a sauropod's going to eat it and spend all of your time trying to get up as high as you can. There aren't a lot of things that bother with them now, and that's probably why they're fairly rare. It's not a particularly effective strategy. So these are, these are things like gymnosperms, right? You know things like, uh, like the pine trees and whatnot. But also, I, I do want you to keep in mind things like cycads, ginkgos, those kind of things would also be included in there. Again, cycads are fairly rare now. You can, I just realized, we, I went to Lowe's the other day, you can buy cycads for $9.99, little ones. <laughs> but these, the ones that they would be feeding on would be much, much larger. You're talking about cycads like that, and much, much higher than I am, right? So these are much higher uh, and larger plants than that. And then let's just look at the teeth before we go. They call them leaf shaped. I just want you to be aware that the word leaf shaped uh, is not characteristic of every member of the group. These guys have what are called peg shaped teeth, and it's very obvious. They look almost identical, and they look like basically just your pointer finger lined up side by side by side by side. And that, from the front to the back, the only difference from front to back 
The front ones are big, the little ones in the back are little. And there's some sort of rate of growth between them so that they're not all this, they're not, you don't have like a bunch of big ones and a bunch of small ones. You just have an even keel around the entire thing. So they're not particularly differentiated, which again, all of this points to not spending a line of time masticating food, not worrying about modifying the food in the mouth, and spending more time uh, dealing with the food once it gets into the body. So I'm going to stop there.